when we look at the history of, of infrastructure and its advocacy in Washington and, and you know, domestically, globally, I think the last decade they've kind of relied on this dream of private public partnerships as, you know, providing this magic pool of money that all these projects would get built and we really saw very little of it. Yes, there's examples of P3s and all of you as companies could say how you've helped engineer those, but effectively they haven't moved the needle like a trillion dollar infrastructure bill could and will. So I mean, we haven't given up on, on P3 or, but I believe that it's probably, they're relying more on, uh, you know, public policy to drive private investment in renewable energy rather than, you know, putting federal money and matching it with bank money. I mean, is that, do you, does that, do you like, do you agree with that theory that we've kind of gone away from relying on, on private par partnerships to fund major projects and we're going back to the major government push or structure policy around allowing investors to get return on investment? Is that a fair way to look at where we are in 2021? Tom Lewis, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. During the House uh, T&I committee hearing where I had the, the privilege of being one of the uh, uh, corporate executives to, to provide testimony. This was a line of questioning, actually. So you're right on. This is a this is a big issue, and one of the real uh, kind of pinch points for the private private investors to jump in is, of course, the the time it takes for you know for projects. And if we can't do anything about that, along with putting money in, stimulus is is great. But you also have to be able to streamline the the regulatory frameworks. You have to have to accelerate uh, the pace at which projects can happen because the private sector financing has a much shorter you know uh, span of time that it's, it's willing to to sit and wait. And until they see that happening, that really you are going to get faster pace. I don't think I don't think it will go away. But because there is so much money on the sidelines, as Brian just said, but it's going to stay on the sidelines for the most part until they really believe it, that it's going, products are going to be able to happen faster. So, but that means streamline, uh, streamline permitting. Is that what you're implying that there's just the regulatory process is slowing down more major offshore wind or, or major full scale solar or that kind of stuff? Or, or were you? Just... Yeah, permitting is, is obviously a big part of it, but every step of the process is actually needs to go faster. And, and a lot of our, our federal clients, and this happens at the state and local levels too, they say P3, but they don't want to give up their control. They want to run it just like they run a design bid build program. All the same levels of comments, hundreds and hundreds of comments, too many cooks in the kitchen. So it's not just the permitting, it's just it's the whole culture of, of how they run their products. That has to change for the money to really come off the sidelines in a major way from the private investors through a series of required disclosures that will have to be made by companies to their shareholders by projects to their funders to banks if you're trying to finance it's everywhere in other words tom Absolutely. you'd agree with that from where you are uh and related back to your climate resilience platform at wsp which do you say that's a, a fair assessment from your client base i totally agree and i would broaden it even further i, I think saying environmental justice is, is talking about a slice of it and i think matt Put it well. I think now it's, it's going broader than that. It, it's going fully across all organizations and every element of every one of those organizations. And we've had that exact dialogue here at WSP over the last year where you can't talk about it. Oh, that's our equity team over there. That's our sustainability team over there. We, the reason we created the business line that I'm now leading, and it's not a PL, it, it's built. To, to work dynamically across every region, across every business, every other business line, because it's the only way you can do it. It's got to be cross-cutting. So it's not just an environmental issue. It, it is an equity and social justice and an inclusion and diversity issue. We, where do you draw the line between a corporate inclusion and diversity program and walking the talk of I and D versus equity and social justice? There's no way to draw that line. Now they're different, but they're very much overlapping. They have to be synergistic. Otherwise, what happens is you sub-optimize each one. Yeah. And the same thing that we're talking about at WSP, I believe needs to happen across the federal government. And I believe this administration is really looking at it that way. It's not just an environmental justice issue. 
I would think a pathway and our, our industry together could agree that we would support a user pay hybrid system along with an increase in corporate taxes uh, to, to lower some of those increases with having fees on water, on uh, you know, uh, in internet access, communications, phone, everything, uh, and, and, and energy and transportation, right? So the gas tax is one, but there's, you know, do electric cars pay the gas tax? Is it a mileage fee for the use of the roads? I mean, that's the transportation rather than energy. So, so some kind of hybrid where all four core pieces of infrastructure are paying is, is a compromise. I think that's possible. Right? I agree with your point, Grant, about a hybrid, because if you go straight user fee, you're gonna get pushed back from the equity. Uh, yeah, perspective, right? Because it has a greater impact on the most vulnerable, the lowest income from a percentage standpoint. Um, and so finding a way to do a hybrid that balances that will then allow you to, to be able to stand that pushback from the more progressive uh, members of, of Congress who are going to absolutely come at it from the equity standpoint. So let's assume the premise that some form of the infrastructure bill as it is being presented will be passed, you know, this year, let's say. So if you were uh, looking at the opportunities uh, for project work for environmental service, uh, consulting, engineering, design, permitting, project management, uh, where would you go? Where would you, what agencies do you feel uh, have the highest uh, opportunity? Uh, prior to the, taking this new role on January 1st of this year, I was WSP's president of our federal program. So I was leading a PNL. We We asked ourselves this exact question and uh, there was earlier discussion of, of the Army Corps and, and Civil Works in particular. Money is going to move away from MILCON, the military construction, not totally away, but as a relative percentage, it's going to move away from MILCON and towards Civil Works. So I would say all aspects of Civil Works, but especially you know, the flood control, resilience, uh, tie-ins, the climate tie-ins. I've had multiple conversations as recently as two weeks ago with headquarters folks at Army Corps, and they're absolutely looking at this. So that, that's one area. I think also with the climate and resilience tie-in, you know, we've focused heavily on uh, you know, the, the HUD Community Development Block Grant. You have the old Disaster Recovery Grant program, but now you've got the MIT program, tens of billions of dollars going to places like Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, the Carolinas. Um, absolutely need to be looking there. Um, and, and, and you can both be at the programmatic level if you're in that game, but if you're not, you, you play the downstream part of the, of, of the, the flow of money and go for the actual projects that end up at the sub-grantee level, the state and local clients, um, but it's federal funding. And so you need to have people who understand how to work within the federal dynamic because of, because of all the fire implications and all the clawbacks that exist if you don't do it right. Same thing with the FEMA, the BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program. Started with $500 million in it under the prior administration, it's only going to go up under the current administration. And once again, yes, it's federal funding, but it, you have to work with the local sub grantees, you know, and put the applications together. So any, any company that's listening to this can do that, even if they're not a federal contractor and they don't have the, the FAR compliant, DCA audited overheads and all that kind of thing. Again, so even if you're not a federal contractor, you need to be looking, you need to be following the money and, and there is going to be a lot of opportunity. Um, and of course you mentioned, other people mentioned too, the EPA, there's gonna be more funding there. There's no question about it. Again, not just you know, nature-based solutions, which was brought up, but also just the traditional uh, super fun, brownfields type opportunities. Um, and, and all the interior, uh, you know, the parks, the you know, taking away the privatized prisons. Um, almost every aspect of, of the, the federal civilian industry will, will be benefited, I believe, over the, over the next four years. Do we believe that all these other agencies that may be not directly responsible for uh, the electricity infrastructure will invest heavily in their own uh, energy, you know, security, independence, and renewable platform, right? So 
In other words, you know, DOD was once the a biggest, one of the biggest buyers of solar, right? In the early 2010s, right? That was, they were, they were the biggest market for a while. So are we going to see a lot more government installations that, so distributed energy in federal facilities, as opposed to just federal money for uh, utilities? Yeah, I, I would say if you broaden the conversation a bit beyond just renewables, you talk about electrification, absolutely. Because there's a tie in there, the battery storage, uh, the, the new vehicle fleets, the commitment of the Biden administration with, with entities like the Postal Service, as well as the other civilian agencies that have big fleets of vehicles. I mean, you, looking at electrification, both horizontal infrastructure and, and the buildings themselves, going away from all the other fossil-based fuels and heating type solutions, uh, that's going to be huge, huge opportunity for our industry. And there'll be tons of funding going that direction. And, and renewables play, plays right into that. On fleet management and new vehicles and changing the fleet to clean vehicles, basically. 